Good afternoon, and welcome to the Employer Link webinar series presented by McAfee and Taft. My name is Brad Neese, Managing Editor of Employer Link. Today we'll be exploring the impact of the U.S. Supreme Court decision last June that struck down key provisions of the Defense of Marriage Act as unconstitutional and its practical effect on employers. McAfee and Taft attorneys Bill Frudenrich, Brandon Long, and Charlie Plum will unravel this landmark decision along with the subsequent guidance that has been issued by federal agencies, and they'll discuss the ruling's possible wider-reaching implications and provide employers with insight and practical advice for implementing the new rules in the workplace. Uh, before we get started, though, there are a few p items I would like to point out. Uh, our next webinar, titled Bottom Line Decisions, Money Saving Strategies Under Workers' Comp Reform, will be pro broadcast two weeks from today on February 5th. As you may know, Oklahoma's new workers' compensation law goes into effect next month, and while it's too soon to tell exactly what impact the new administrative system and Oklahoma option will have on the bottom line, early projections look favorable for employers. Just how favorable may depend on which option you choose. During this one-hour webinar, employee benefits attorneys Brandon Long and Mark Spencer break down the options by the numbers based on projections by leading industry analysts. They'll discuss new products being developed in the marketplace and review practical considerations for implementing an employer-sponsored injury benefit plan. Joining them in the discussion is special guest Jay Eshelman, Oklahoma Area President with Gallagher Risk Management Services, and you can find out more information and register for that webinar at EmployerLink.com. Uh, second, this program has been approved for one hour of general recertification credit through the HR Certification Institute. <clears throat> for those who pre-registered for HRCI credit, we will be sending a follow-up email tomorrow with program details uh, for recertification submission. And lastly, on your screen just below the slide presentation area, you should see a tab called Supporting Material, which will allow you to download a PDF version of today's presentation materials. And those materials are also available on the webinar resource page which you can find at EmployerLink.com. As I mentioned earlier, our presenters today are McAfee and Taft attorneys Bill Frudenrich, Brandon Long, and Charlie Plum. Bill and Brandon are employee benefits attorneys who work with employers of all sizes in designing, analyzing, and implementing cost containment strategies for company-sponsored health and wellness plans. Their areas of expertise also extend to retirement plan design, deferred compensation, COBRA and HIPAA compliance, and the representation of clients in audits and investigations by the IRS and U.S. Department of Labor. Charlie is a labor and employment attorney who is a frequent speaker and author on workplace issues. In addition to being a regular presenter for Employer Link webinars and seminars, he serves as legal editor and contributing author for EmployerLink.com, co-editor for the Oklahoma Employment Law Letter, and co-editor for the Oklahoma section of 50 Laws in 50 States, the annual guidebook for employers and HR professionals. Much of his practice is dedicated to counseling employers on compliance with a broad range of state and federal employment laws and regulations and educating management on best practices for avoiding disputes arising from the employer-employee relationship. So with those introductions, I now turn it over to Charlie to kick things off. Thanks, Brad. Uh, what we want to cover in today's uh, webinar is really uh, an overview of what has changed for employers during the last six months regarding same-sex marriages. And to accomplish that, uh, we're going to cover uh, legal interpretation and guidances that have been issued by various uh, governmental agencies that are responsible for benefits and employment laws. Uh, we'll talk about legal trends uh, we're seeing around the country on these issues, and we'll also uh, discuss what steps other employers, uh, both in Oklahoma and around the country, are taking uh, when addressing the same-sex marriage uh, questions and issues. Now, by necessity, uh, we're going to approach these issues from two perspectives. Uh, we'll start uh, talking about what's happened and what's going to happen uh, with same-sex marriages in the context of employment laws, such as Title VII and FMLA, uh, those sorts of things. And then I'm going to uh, pass the baton to Bill and Brandon, uh, who will address uh, what sort of issues are coming up in the context of employee benefits and tax-related issues. And I can tell you right now, uh, between these two categories, 
uh, the benefits and tax-related issues, uh, we've seen a lot more activity uh, from governmental agencies issuing guidances than from employment law. And that will be, become pretty obvious uh, in the course of our webinar today. And our objectives today are really uh, fairly simple. Uh, number one, we want to we want to ta- talk to you about what we think uh, the actions employers need to be taking right now, wh- where we stand right now in the in the wake of the Supreme Court ruling on DOMA, and uh, but we also want to talk about what you need to keep your eye on uh, for future action. Uh, we want to put you in a position where you can be sensitive to changes that are most likely coming down the road so you can be proactive in your planning. So with that, let's start uh, with talking about what the Defense of Marriage Act, DOMA, what it really stood for. And there, and there were two key provisions in DOMA. Uh, the first provision uh, was uh, uh, what I'll call a full faith and credit uh, provision of that act, and that really stood for the proposition that each state can decide whether they're going to allow same-sex marriages, and each state can decide uh, whether they are going to recognize same-sex marriages that were legal in another state. In other words, this this first portion of DOMA stood for the proposition that states hold the primary role in regulating marriages. The second key provision in DOMA uh, went to defining marriage. And that second uh, key provision in DOMA defined marriage for purposes of, and this is key, federal rights and protections, not state rights and protection, but defined marriage under DOMA for federal rights and protections to be exclusively uh, relationships between a man and a woman. Now, we had a Supreme Court decision in June of last year, the Windsor decision, and there's been a lot of uh, misinformation and some incorrect assumptions. So I think it's I think it's important to know what the case was about, what the Windsor decision did, and what it didn't do. So let's talk briefly about what the Windsor decision, uh, the facts about that case. The Windsor case uh, involved a same-sex couple who were legally married in Canada and had uh, moved to New York and New York recognized that Canadian same-sex marriage. And the whole case, the Windsor case, really turned on the issue of whether federal laws, federal estate laws, should, uh, estate tax laws, I should say, should treat same-sex couples the same as marriages between a man and a woman. So it focused on federal law. So here's what the Windsor ruling did do. The Windsor ruling last June, the Supreme Court said, for the purposes of federal benefits and entitlements, and again, I want to stress, for purposes of federal benefits and entitlements, not state benefits and entitlements, for federal benefits and entitlements, the Supreme Court struck down as unconstitutional DOMA's exclusion of same-sex marriages. Now, here's what the Windsor ruling did not do. The Windsor ruling did not force any states to recognize same-sex marriages. That didn't happen. Uh, another bit of information, uh, misinformation, the Windsor ruling did not uh, recognize sexual orientation as a protected claim for purposes of federal employment discrimination law. And in some ways, what the Windsor decision didn't do is as important as understanding as what it did do. Now, in the wake of the Windsor decision, uh, there have been a lot of questions we're receiving from employers, and we need to realize that as we sit here today, 17 states and the District of Columbia do recognize same-sex marriages. So I guess that means 33 do not. So what does that mean for employers that fall in one of three categories? What do employers who operate in a state that does not, does not recognize same-sex marriages, what do they do? Category two, what if you're an employer and you have employees in more than one state and the states where your employees reside and work have differing laws on same-sex marriages? What are you supposed to do? And finally, what if you're an employer that has hired an employee or transferred an employee who was married uh, in a state that recognized same-sex marriages, but now that employee is hired or transferred into a state that does not recognize 
same-sex marriages. Those are uh, those are the things we're wrestling with, and employers are wrestling with. And I will tell you, in the post-Windsor world of employment law, uh, I think you're going to see that the the governmental agencies like the Department of Labor and IRS that that Bill and Brandon are going to are going to talk about have been more aggressive in issuing guidances and rulings interpreting Windsor. The flip side of the coin, uh, there haven't been that many pronouncements by uh, the employment law agencies. One exception is the Department of Labor when it comes to uh, FMLA rights in light of the Windsor decision. And in August 2013, you know, shortly after the Windsor decision, uh, the Department of Labor issued fact sheet number 28F, and you can find it very easily on the web, their website. And keep in mind uh, that under the FMLA, eligible employees are entitled up to 12 weeks of unpaid leave to care for a spouse. Now, what this August 2013 fact sheet from the Wage and Hour Division does is it defines spouse for purposes of FMLA after Windsor. And what the Wage and Hour Division says post-Windsor is that for purposes of FMLA leave, a spouse includes anyone who's defined or recognized as a spouse under state law for purposes of marriage where the employee resides, not where you as an employer are necessarily headquartered or located, but where the employee resides. So that means in the post-Windsor world, for purposes of FMLA rights, FMLA spousal leave is available to your employees if they reside in a state, and again, reside where they reside, if they reside in a state that permits same-sex marriage, or they reside in a state that recognizes same-sex marriages from other states. Now, there are some legal trends that we're seeing and, and some previews of what we may anticipate in the future, again, in the context of employment law. Uh, now, we mentioned that the Windsor decision did not recognize sexual preference or sexual orientation as a protected class under our existing laws, for example, Title VII. But we have seen in the last 12 months courts around the country willing to recognize discrimination based on sexual stereotyping. You know, a claim that an em- a female employee was discriminatorily treated by uh, their employer because they weren't feminine enough. A claim that a male employee was discriminatorily treated by their employer because they weren't masculine enough. So even though Title VII doesn't recognize sexual preference or sexual orientation as a protected class, and the Windsor decision didn't change that, we do, we do see courts in many cases, recognizing discrimination based on sexual stereotyping. There's also been some activity in the federal legislature. Uh, specifically, in November of 2013, the Senate passed the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, and you may have heard it referred to as ENDA. And this is a new law that prohibits discrimination in hiring and employment based on an individual's sexual orientation identity or preference. So ENDA would have the effect, if passed by Congress and signed by the President, it would have the effect of recognizing sexual orientation, identity, and preference as a protected class. I mentioned that that law passed, or that bill passed our Senate in November of 2013. It is sitting in the House awaiting activity, and, and there's no activity uh, as of today. Another trend uh, we see, and I'm sure you've seen in the media, is a series of court cases around the, comp- uh, around the country that have challenged state same-sex marriage laws. And we're going to talk uh, in a moment about our most recent ruling involving Oklahoma. But we do see a trend of more legal challenges around the country to various state same-sex laws. And there does seem to be uh, some momentum in state legislatures around the country moving towards recognizing same-sex unions or same-sex marriages. So it's clear, I think, that the legal landscape uh, when it comes to employment laws and same-sex marriages, it's shifting and 
uh, evolving rapidly. We also see some practical trends uh, in the workplace. How are employers dealing with issues of fairness or administrative headaches? How do they handle the prospect of potentially treating employees differently based on where they live from an employment standpoint uh, when it comes to benefits or leaves? Well, a couple of interesting uh, surveys that have come out. Uh, one most recently, uh, some Fortune 500 companies were surveyed, and two-thirds of them said they were already offering health insurance and other spousal benefits to same-sex partners already, and that includes Walmart, for example, Hormel, and Wendy's. We're also seeing that employers uh, aren't willing or uh, interested in treating FMLA different based on uh, where their employees are located. So many employers are voluntarily providing FMLA spousal leave to same-sex couples, all of their same-sex couples, regardless of where they're located. Uh, I will tell you, as a practical matter, uh, those employers that are choosing to do that, they are requiring uh, their same-sex employees who are seeking FMLA leave, spousal leave to demonstrate they have a, a bona fide and legally recognized union. But they are, uh, they are voluntarily providing that in many instances because from a fairness standpoint and an administration standpoint, uh, they've decided that's the best ro- road to go in terms of handling FMLA spousal leave. I mentioned uh, a new development here in Oklahoma last Tuesday. uh, We had a federal court in Tulsa uh, find that Oklahoma's constitutional amendment, which much like DOMA's, limited marriages in the state of Oklahoma to opposite-sex couples. And last week, our federal court found that uh, Oklahoma constitutional provision uh, to be uh, unconstitutional and struck it. Now, from a procedural standpoint, uh, that ruling is stayed, meaning it will not have any legal effect until that uh, appeal is heard and decided by our Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, You may have also heard uh, in the last month and a half, uh, Utah court uh, likewise struck down uh, Utah's uh, statute that that prohibited same-sex marriages, that uh, decision is on appeal to the same Tenth Circuit uh, Court of Appeals that the Oklahoma decision uh, will be decided. That uh, Utah decision is going to be heard on an expedite and decided on an expedited fast-track basis. Uh, we anticipate that from a practical standpoint, the Utah decision and our own Oklahoma decision will be consolidated and heard and decided. And uh, so... Uh, It won't happen tomorrow, but we're we're hopeful that uh, some clarity and a ruling on that decision is is going to come uh, sooner rather than later. Now, uh, what does this uh, Oklahoma, the federal court decision in Oklahoma, uh, mean for Oklahoma employers right now? The answer is legally nothing has changed, but this kind of ruling, I think, uh, is another indication and and perhaps a wake-up call from an employment law standpoint, that you as employers uh, who want to be proactive and and get on the front end of this need to start planning on how you are going to be addressing these issues from an employment law standpoint and also be aware of the very specific change that the FMLA uh, August 2013 uh, advisory from the Wage and Hour holds. Now, we're going to change gears now out of the realm of employment law to uh, the benefits issues uh, who, uh, which Brandon and Bill are going to handle. And I think, uh, from my understanding, you guys are going to tell us that we've got some specific marching orders, some things that are, are very clear we have to do, uh, need to do as employers when it comes to benefits, right? Right, right. Thanks, Charlie. Um, this is Brandon Long. Thanks so much for joining us today. You know, when the Supreme Court issued its decision last June, um, it, the effect on employee benefits and whether there was any impact at all, was obvious maybe to some and not so obvious to others. Um, The Supreme Court clearly understood, even though they were looking at, even though the court was looking at an estate tax issue, when it issued its decision, it clearly recognized that its decision would have far-reaching implications. In fact, the Supreme Court discussed in its decision how 
the Defense of Marriage Act and its definition of a, of marriage between a man and a woman um, was used or applicable in over a thousand statutes and regulations that apply for federal tax purposes. It also specifically the court also recognized that uh, benefits is you know is one area that would be impacted by its decision and and that it was impacted by DOMA um, or at least the, the provision at issue in DOMA. And the Supreme Court obviously uh, gave thought to that when it issued its decision. The decision has wide-ranging implications for employee benefit plans. Benefit rules where marital status play a key role include the taxable status of employer-provided health coverage, COBRA rules, HIPAA special enrollment rights, cafeteria plan election change events, reimbursements under flexible spending accounts, and retirement plan issues as well. And we're going to talk about all of those as we kind of dive into this. It's important as we kind of crank along here that we think about the distinction between uh, a couple of different terms, marriage, domestic partnership, and civil union. A marriage, a same-sex marriage, a marriage between people of the same gender, um, for federal tax purposes, and I'll discuss this why in a second, it has, is this, it, those types of marriages have to be given the same recognition for federal tax purposes as um, a marriage between a man and a woman. Domestic partnerships and civil unions do not have the same level of protection. Um, so in June, the Supreme Court issued its decision in Windsor. And for a lot of our clients that are Oklahoma-based, and, and you know we have some uh, that do business outside of Oklahoma or have employees outside of Oklahoma, and, and those we counsel those people on how to deal with their benefit structures. But for the most part, for most of our clients who just have employees in Oklahoma, it was kind of a little bit of a let's just, we don't have to do anything different because Oklahoma does not recognize same-sex marriage. And like Charlie said, uh, the Supreme Court made it clear in its decision that it was not striking down the portion of the Defense of Marriage Act which says uh, that one state does not have to recognize a marriage entered into in another state. But then, so we, we kind of crank along here for a couple months, and in late August, the IRS issued um, some guidance, a revenue ruling, on August 29th, and that revenue ruling has very, very important uh, implications for benefit plans. The Department of Labor in September, several weeks after the IRS, the Department of Labor issued guidance also um, kind of stating its position on Windsor as applicable to areas that it has uh, control over. So the IRS has control, if you think about it for a second, areas that the IRS would, would have control over include you know, the taxable status of health benefits, um, welfare benefits, areas that the Department of Labor might have uh, governance or interest in are COBRA, HIPAA, some of the areas that Bill's going to talk about in a minute. And both the IRS and the Department of Labor, in their guidance issued in August and then again in September, stated that all same-sex marriages will be recognized regardless of the state uh, where the marriage was entered into. So before this guidance in August and September, Oklahoma employer calls and we say, you know what, why don't we use a state of domicile uh, definition of marriage? So if, if if two people live in Oklahoma, then and Oklahoma does not recognize same-sex marriage, then even though those two folks were married, let's say, in California, let's not worry about it. Well, the, uh, the let's not worry about the implications on our benefit plans. Well, the guidance issued by the IRS and the Department of Labor changed that because the, they those agencies have come out and said that all same-sex marriages will be recognized for all uh, federal tax purposes and regardless of where the marriage was entered into. Um, this would include COBRA. This is going to include HIPAA. And this guidance is generally effective or was generally effective, at least from the IRS in September, uh, so three or four months ago. So there's some things that are clear and some, some issues that are not so clear um, what is clear, for benefits purposes, domestic partnerships are not recognized, are not giving any sort of special treatment. Civil unions are also not given any sort of special treatment. And the other thing that is clear is that they're going to issue more guidance. We're, we're definitely in a state of evolving guidance. One thing that Bill and I were chatting about just before we got on here, one thing we see is people will ask us, people that are already providing, let's say, domestic partner benefits, 
And, and keep in mind, there's a distinction, like I said at the beginning, between a same-sex marriage and domestic partners. Some clients provide benefits to domestic partners and don't really talk about the term marriage in their policies and handbooks. You need to be real clear, and you're, if you're providing benefits to domestic partners, you need to be real clear um, about what a domestic partner means and, and what the criteria is to qualify as a domestic partner, because... Theoretically, your brother, if your brother lives with you and you don't have it defined correctly, your sister, I mean, somebody like that could be recognized as a domestic partner. You just need to drill down in your policies and make it very clear. What is not clear about Windsor? Um, the retroactive effects of Windsor. In other words, so, okay, IRS, you come out and you say employers for benefit purposes, for federal tax purposes, have to recognize marriages of same-sex spouses regardless of where they're in inter- where they're entered into, starting when. Um, you say the guidance that the IRS issued said effective September 13, but what about what about the the um, let's just use an example. I'll say Bill and Charlie. Bill and Charlie were married. Um, let's say back in they've been let's say they've been married since 2010 in the state of California, and let's say uh, Charlie passed away in August, and the benefit plan that the, the his re- employer's retirement plan said that, that the benefit goes to the surviving spouse. Well, at that time, we didn't recognize Bill as Charlie's surviving spouse, and so we paid the benefit to his beneficiary. Um, maybe it was his children. Maybe it was uh, you know, whoever else he had named. Do we have to go back now, Bill? Because Bill was recognized, if Bill was Charlie's spouse back in, uh, you know, whenever Charlie passed away, do we have to go back and undo the benefit payment to Charlie's named beneficiary who was not Bill's spouse. Um, another question that comes up is on our retirement plans, you know, if we've got some clients who have the definition of spouse in their retirement benefit, for example, retirement plan, um, do we change that definition of spouse to provide um, that, it, that we recognize same-sex marriages? And starting when, do we go back to the beginning of time? Do we go back till the... the uh, Windsor decision, do we go back till September? The IRS has not given us guidance on that yet. And we, our recommendation is at this point, and Bill, jump in if you disagree, right. our re- recommendation is at this point, in terms of amending benefit plans, we do not recommend that we jump in, the, you know, just jump off the cliff and start amending benefit plan documents until the IRS issues the guidance that they have promised to issue on that topic. So, Mentioned this already, but some of the benefit plan implications include health benefits, cafeteria plans, flexible spending accounts, health savings accounts, COBRA rules, HIPAA special enrollment rights, and retirement plan benefits. And we're going to talk about each of those um, one at a time. So on the health benefits side, one of the issues that comes up is do we have to cover same-sex spouses? Do we have to cover spouses at all? And, and the answer is no to both of those questions. You do not have to, if you are an employer, especially if your plan is subject to ERISA. Um, you do not have to cover spouses. You don't have to cover same-sex spouses if you choose not to. Now we think there is some risk, some potential um, discrimination risks with not covering same-sex spouses if you're covering spouses of the opposite gender. Um, but the answer. Technically, we believe as a group is that you do not have to cover them. Now, if you are a governmental employer, I looked at the sign-up list just before we got on here, and and we we definitely have some governmental folks listening in. The decision issued last week by the federal court in Tulsa creates special issues for you as a governmental employer. And I would encourage you, we can't get into it here because most of our folks that are on this call, this webinar today, have a risk of... uh, have plans that are governed by ERISA, but if you have a, if you're a governmental employer that does not have to comply with ERISA, because of the decision last week, I would strongly encourage you to get with our benefits uh, folks, whoever you talk to at our firm or, or your other outside counsel, and talk them through what that decision might mean for you as a governmental employer. The other issue that comes up is uh, the tax treatment of employer paid health care. So now it is clear that. Um, an employer can no longer treat the benefits received by a same-sex spouse as taxable income to the working employee. Um, So to the extent you provide 
benefits to same-sex spouses under your, your health plan. Um, you can no longer impute, treat the benefits provided under the health plan as taxable income to the working employee. A couple other issues we're not going to spend a lot of time in, on. Uh, the guidance issued by the IRS in August, you know, stated that employees have the ability to go back for all years for which the period of limitations uh, for seeking a, a tax refund is still open and um, seek a refund of any um, income taxes that, that they paid that they should not have paid on the value of coverage that would have otherwise been excluded from their income had they been uh, treated as spouses. So, they're, you know, on the individual level for your employees, they have the right uh a limited right to go back and seek a refund of income taxes. And um, the other thing is the, the guidance said that, you know, asked the question, can employers uh, claim a refund for excess Social Security taxes and Medicare taxes paid on benefits? And the answer is yes, that employers can, but this is one of the areas the IRS said we intend to issue additional guidance, and so that additional guidance will tell us administratively what employers need to do to seek the refund for those amounts. Um, domestic partnerships and civil unions, as I've already mentioned, you do not have to recognize uh, those unless you choose to. Even the guidance issued by the IRS and the Department of Labor um, made it clear that, that those types of arrangements that are not do not rise to the level of a marriage under some state law um, do not have to be recognized for this for health coverage purposes. I'm going to turn it over to Bill. Uh, he's going to talk about cafeteria plans and some other welfare issues. Thank you, Brandon. And again, I want to thank everybody for joining today. Uh, my name is Bill Frudenrich, and I'm going to drill down on some issues. First issue I'm going to talk about is cafeteria plans. Now, under the new rules, under the Windsor case, coverage for same-sex spouses may now be paid on a pre-tax basis. But let's talk about some other issues that surround a cafeteria plan. The the key issue is change of status. As we know, if there's a change in status, you can allow mid-year changes to your cafeteria plan. That's primarily your health plan and your other benefits that you pay on a pre-tax basis. On December 19th, the IRS uh, issued notice 2014-1. And in this notice, because we got a lot of calls last fall saying, okay, I have same-sex partners, domestic partners. I have same-sex marriage. And with the change of that case, I recognize that, and I've been paying that on a pre-tax basis. Can I do a mid-year election change in the fall of 2013 to now convert those benefits to a pre-tax basis? And in the notice, it's basically stated that if you had a cafeteria plan year, it covered the period from June to June, June 26, 2013, or uh, December 16, 2013, on the date of the issuance of the revenue. I mean, of the notice, you could you could allow participants to change those elections to a pre-tax basis. Now, there's one other issue I want to talk about with cafeteria plans, and cafeteria plans don't always get the same. Oh, I don't know attention that other benefit plans do, like health plans and retirement plans, I, I encourage everyone to look at the definition of who is a spouse under a cafeteria plan. You may not want to cover same-sex marriage, or you may not want to recognize that, and that's okay if you're willing to take the risk on a discrimination case. However, if I have a cafeteria plan that's integrated with my health plan or wrapped together in a wrap document, and that cafeteria plan says, you know, the definition of a spouse is a legally recognized spouse. Well, if I don't have, and if I don't want to cover that same-sex marriage, if I don't have special language, I basically have, a, I should allow that participant to uh, participate in the cafeteria plan, which then I could say there could be an argument that integrates back to the health plan. So you need to take a look at all of those definitions. The other issue with the cafeteria plan is now if I have someone who's legally recognized as a same-sex spouse, that under the dependent care option, they can do $5,000 as a married participant. 
FSAs, these flexible spending accounts, again, we can now include the same-sex spouse uh, under the FSA and reimburse them for their expenses if you cover a same-sex spouse under your plan. Um, if you, you know, if you already have domestic partner benefits or same-sex benefits, this hopefully, if you're a calendar year plan, you enroll everyone that you included to enroll. Um, on the flexible spending accounts on and on the cafeteria plans, question came up to me oh last week was okay. We want to recognize the same sex spouse. However, we did not get them enrolled for the 1-1 calendar year enrollment date. And we believe that we might have made some mistakes. What should we do? Well, I said, well, since you're so early in the year and there's going to be a lot of mistakes in administering these types of plans, my practical advice was just go ahead and enroll them as soon as possible. I think we're going to see a lot of groups who are still waiting, hoping that the Oklahoma Supreme Court case will be overturned and that they don't have to comply with these rules. Uh, there could be some issues in transition. What's your thought on that, Brandon? I agree completely. Okay. The next issue is on the health spending accounts. Again, if I'm recognizing a same-sex spouse in my, in my plan, I can do, I can now can do $6,500 for the 2014 plan year. Now, um, with the domestic partners, civil unions, they can still, contri- still contribute under the old rules. And again, with the HSA, just like the FSA and the cafeteria plans, you need to review the definition of who's a spouse under those, under those plans. COBRA. A COBRA is an area that we've had numerous problems with uh, domestic partners. Now, the way the, this is a federally recognized COBRA law, and, did, you know, most of your plans that we see are fully insured in the state of Oklahoma. We have larger employers who self-insure, and we have a number of those clients, but, you know, the majority are going to be a fully insured contract. Now, how were you administering your plan prior to the change in the law or this or the you know the case that came out last week? Well, generally, we were following the rules of a COBRA benefit for a domestic partner or a same-sex marriage that we didn't recognize in Oklahoma. You were not eligible for COBRA benefits, and I have a number of plans that extended that to their uh, employees, but if you have a fully insured contract, your insurance carrier like Blue Cross and Blue Shield or United Healthcare don't recognize those benefits. So if you were providing COBRA coverage, that was a mistake. However, with the change in the law, if I have a domestic partner that is now recognized as a same-sex legal marriage, I have to provide that person COBRA coverage. So make sure that you're doing that correctly. What well, was really confusing, too, with under the old COBRA rights, if you had a just a pure domestic partner plan, that the, the domestic partner was not recognized for COBRA rights, but the dependent, if you look under the definition of dependent under the COBRA regs, that dependent of that uh, domestic partner probably should have been provided COBRA rights. So a lot of inconsistencies, but going forward, same-sex spouse, if you have them covered under your health plan, you offer them uh, the COBRA rights. Domestic partners do not get offered COBRA rights. However, their children may be offered the COBRA rights. HIPAA, HIPAA, now what happened back in 2013 after we had the federal court decision. Well, the question came up again is, okay, have we had a qualifying event for a special enrollment to add the same sex spouse? And the answer to that question and the advice that we've been giving is, yes, you can have, you can add that person as a, a qualifying event or special enrollee. Now, 
if you did not offer that to a um, to an enrollee, you could have some some issues if you were providing coverage to those same sex spouses. And again, under HIPAA, you have to be very careful under the way the language is written under your plan because you have these special enrollment rights. And if your plan does not specifically exclude that same sex marriage, you could have a participant who could bring a cause of action under HIPAA saying, listen, according to the terms of my plan document that doesn't specifically exclude same sex uh, a same sex marriage as spouse, I could inadvertently have a contract that allows them to participate. So do you agree with that too, Brandon? Yes, I do. Yeah. So again, it's very, very important to um, go back and look at all of your plan documents, your cafeteria plans, your medical plans, your group term life, your group term disability, all of those. Um, so, again, you don't have, ERISA and these court cases do not force you to offer coverage to a same-sex spouse. Brandon, I'll turn it back over to you to talk about retirement plans. So many employers maintain retirement plans to provide post-retirement income for their employees. Um, these plans can take a variety of forms. Most common are tax-qualified retirement plans uh, that set, must satisfy certain requirements of the Internal Revenue Code um, to constitute a tax-qualified plan. These would include things like a traditional pension plan. The most common anymore is a 401k plan. Most of our clients um, private sector clients especially, they, they have, a, you know, kind of a traditional 401K plan. And then there can be other types of qualified plans as well, like an employee stock ownership plan. And what we're going to do here with this slide, we're going to talk for just a second about um, some of the impact of um, the Windsor decision on retirement benefits or retirement plans in, per in particular. So when the IRS issued its guidance in late August following the Windsor decision in June, uh, it, it also issued, the IRS also, also issued a set of frequently asked questions. And those questions provided some even additional guidance regarding qualified plans in particular. So uh, as of September 16 of 2013, a qualified retirement plan must treat a same-sex spouse as a spouse for purpose of satisfying federal tax laws related to qualified plans. Now, what does that mean? Well, you know, I told you a little bit ago that that for those employers in Oklahoma that that only do business that only do business in Oklahoma or only have employees in Oklahoma, initially we thought it was no big deal um, because Windsor did not strike down the other provision of DOMA and didn't require one state to recognize marriage from another. But again, all of you folks that have benefit plans that are qual retirement plans, for example, that are tax qualified, they have to comply with federal tax law to remain tax qualified. And so the effect, one of the consequences of the IRS issuing its later decision or guidance providing that you have to recognize or that they're going to recognize same-sex marriage regardless of where uh, of the state of domicile is this kind of a scenario. So a retirement plan, a 401k plan, provides that a participant's account must be paid to the spouse upon death, upon the participant's death, unless the spouse consents to a different beneficiary. Um, the retirement plan, if you have a 401k plan in the scenario I just described, which is very common, which says if the participant dies, the benefit goes to the surviving spouse. Now, regardless of where the folks, the, the employee and the same-sex spouse were married, regardless, in, uh, regardless of where they live, um, the benefit has to be paid to the same-sex beneficiary, the same-sex surviving spouse. Um, and that, that is a, a new wrinkle. Some other ideas or some uh, areas of impact. So what if you have a beneficiary designation on file um, from an employee designating someone other than their same-sex spouse as the beneficiary? Well, if your retirement plan is subject to the qualified plan rules and it requires um, a employee to get the consent of a spouse before naming someone other than the spouse as a beneficiary, that beneficiary designation may be invalid. And so you may need to go back and get the consent of the, other, of the spouse uh, to the non-spouse beneficiary designation. Um, 
Again, I've already mentioned the default beneficiary issue. If there's no beneficiary designation on file and your plan says that a benefit's paid to the surviving spouse, then that would include a same-sex spouse. Um, required minimum distributions, a same-sex spouse is eligible for more favor favorable treatment under the required minimum distribution rules as to timing and the value of the benefits provided. And so you, that's something you need to be getting with your TPA and your legal consultants to help you evaluate. You know, the required minimum distribution rules govern uh, when folks have to take distributions from their benefit plan, and the uh, the IRS guidance has changed the way that that, um, that the required minimum distributions will be calculated. Rollovers, a same-sex spouse will have a right to a spousal rollover um, to their own IRA or to another retirement plan, just as a any other spouse would as well. A um, couple other quick areas. Qualified domestic relations orders, a same-sex spouse would be eligible to be an alternate payee under a quadro uh, without being a dependent, which is a new change. Um, so these are just some areas, some ideas of how um, the IRS guidance has impacted retirement plans. Now, um, in terms of what we should be doing now, you know, Bill mentioned, I think it would be good just for you to look at all of your benefit plans and look at where they use the word spouse and do your plans define a spouse to mean man between a marriage between man and a woman. And while we don't recommend, recommend right now that you go back and retroactively amend anything because we're still waiting on the IRS to tell us um, when or how to do an amendment and when it has to be done and when it needs to be effective, we do think it's important that you at least understand where those terms fit into your benefits analysis. We also recommend for those of you, like we mentioned, that provide benefits to domestic partners. Make sure that your, um, your, your handbooks and guidance defining a domestic partner uh, are clear as to what a domestic partnership is that you recognize. It, in terms of whether you notify employees of, of these changes, we have, we've kind of struggled with this candidly um, because we feel like the guidance is in such a state of flux. But it seems like it would be a good thing, a good action item for you to notify your employees of the, um, the the changing law, nothing complicated, but it, it would be important, for example, if you have same-sex spouses right now that you do not know about, it would be important for you to know that, that your employee is married to someone else of the same gender because if that employee died, back to my uh, uh, beneficiary designation upon death, back to that scenario, what if they died tomorrow and they had a surviving spouse that you don't know about because you've never advised them uh, of these changing rules. So we we think it would be good to notify uh, your employees. Now, for some employers, that may not make sense. It may make more sense to wait, but I think just generally speaking, if someone asks me, should we notify our employees, I think the answer is yes. It would be a good idea to notify your employees of these changes um, so that you can be aware of them operationally. Op in terms of the your health benefit plan, it, for example, and, you know, if you if you are aware that you have an employee who has a same-sex spouse, and they're covering currently, or you, or they are going to be covered. Their their same sex spouse is going to be covered under your health plan. You immediately need to stop imputing the income to them for the value of those benefits. Um, and we've already talked about that uh, a little bit ago. Plan amendments. I've mentioned this, but do we do it now? Do we do it later? We've had a lot of questions, especially at year end, from clients. You know, they'll send me their retirement plan, for example, and, and it defines a spouse as between a man and a woman. I think it's important to be aware that, that you have that issue. I don't think that it's, it, it's appropriate right now to uh, amend your retirement plan, for example, to change it. I mean, you, you can if you, if you like. I just I think we think it would be better to wait until the IRS issues their promised guidance so we know exactly how far back you amend it to and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, one thing you might do in the notice you issue, um, if, if you choose to issue a notice, is you, you might tell your employees, look, here's some, the law has changed, and so we are, um, and that means A, B, and C to you. That means if you have a, a same-sex spouse, you know, uh, we will or will not cover them, and if we do cover them, the value of the benefits provided, for example, will not be included in, in income. Um, and you might also state in your notice, you might tell your employees when you communicate to them that we're going to presume as an employer that the information we have on file is correct unless we are told otherwise. And the benefit to that would be it would theoretically cut off the, the argument from someone later that, that 
you never told them or that maybe their the employer's records were incorrect well it's if we tell the employees that that um that they need to notify us of their their if they're married to someone of the same sex and we and have never notified the employer before um, we're going to presume that the information we have on file is correct for all benefit plan purposes, and that might provide a little bit of cover. Brandon, I have one one kind of uh, overarching question because, as you as you put it beautifully, when it comes to benefits issues, we are in a state of absolute flux. So, do you think that employers who treat same sex marriages differently from other marriages when it comes to benefits issues? And they're making that distinction. Do you think employers who treat same-sex marriage differently from other marriages when it comes to benefits, are they at risk for some sort of legal challenge or claims of discrimination by their employees or their the employees' same-sex spouses? Yeah, we, we do. And I think that really goes back to kind of your side of the house, Charlie, because I think it, it potentially raises gender discrimination issues potentially. Now, how that will all get fleshed out in court cases, and but... It, yes, I think there is some risk there. Before we close, just a few quick reminders. Uh, tomorrow you'll be getting a follow-up survey about this webinar. Uh, please take a few moments to complete that questionnaire. Your feedback helps us improve our events as well as less, letting us know what topics and issues are, uh, are on the minds of our participants. Also, as I mentioned earlier, those who sign up for HRCI credit at the time of registration We'll receive an email tomorrow with program details for recertification submission. And later this afternoon, an archive version of this webinar broadcast will be uploaded to our webinar resource page, uh, and the downloadable version of the presentation materials can be found there as well. Uh, you can easily ask, access that resource page from the home page of uh, employerlink.com and mcfeetaft.com or mcfeetaft.com. I want to again thank uh, Bill Frudenrich, Brandon Long, and Charlie Plum for presenting today's webinar. And on behalf of the law firm of Max and Tab, thank you for joining us for another EmployerLink webinar. See you next time and have a great afternoon. <laughs>